Brought to you by Proto Labs. Real parts, really fast. Custom metal, plastic, and liquid silicone rubber parts in as fast as one day. Good afternoon. Hello. You can tell you can tell we're from Chicago by our accents. <laughs> it's, it's the hard A's. So um, we have scripts, but don't worry. Uh, we'll uh, try what we lack in fluency. We'll try to make up for uh, in content. Um, but thank you very much for uh, asking us to speak today. We figured out last night actually that uh, Core 77, or specifically Coraflot, are uh, responsible for us coming to the United States four years ago. Jess was browsing the Coraflot site and saw an advert for a teaching position, uh, which I applied for. And a few months later, we moved to Chicago uh, for me to start working at the School of the Arts Institute in their designed objects program. So the conference has covered a lot of ground today, obviously, under the heading of object culture. But what we'd like to talk about more specifically are, are objects as culture. So it's obvious that all designed objects uh, contribute to the culture that they're born into. But in our studio practice, we're interested in how objects can be designed with a level of awareness of their position in the culture that allows those objects to provoke, to ask questions, to critique the status quo, and to reveal new possibilities. To be, if you like, rhetorical objects. The title of our talk, Spectacular Vernacular, comes from an attempt to describe what our independent and collaborative work is doing. So it, it tries to wrap together two different but complementary approaches to object making, both of which attempt some kind of shift in perception as a device to prompt reevaluation. And that shift we're characterizing as being from the spectacular to the vernacular or vice versa. It perhaps says something about uh, the two of us that we ended up reading books on the plane yesterday that both had the word dream in the title, quite by accident. And uh, there was a great quote in Keith Oakley's Such Stuff as Dreams, The Psychology of Fiction, where he says that the book draws on an idea developed by Shakespeare, Coleridge, and Stevenson, and others, that fiction is not just a slice of life, not just entertainment, not just an escape from the everyday. It often includes these. But at its center is a guided dream, a model that we readers and viewers construct in collaboration with the writer, which can enable us to see others and ourselves more clearly. Fiction, Oakley says, is a kind of simulation, but one that runs not on computers, but on minds. A simulation of selves in their interactions with other, others in the social world. So in creating sometimes fictional, sometimes real objects and scenarios, we aim to use design in this way to see others and ourselves more clearly. Thank you. For example, this piece uh, titled A Form of Happiness is a molecular model of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine, as you may know, is an extraordinary chemical that lives in our brains. Oh, one brain we have. As we make discoveries, <laughs> receive rewards, and learn, dopamine is released and fuels the desire for more. We design this particular object for an exhibition about placebo effects in relation to consumer culture. Window shopping is known to result in dopamine release when we find what we're looking for or spot something else desirable. But it is the discovery, rather than the purchase itself, that releases the most dopamine. So this object is intended to work on a few different levels. If considered desirable by a customer, it will have released the chemical it represents in the brain. It comes as a puzzle in a box, and the molecules snap together with built-in magnets reflecting the atomic attraction of the particles. The correct completion of the puzzle will also produce dopamine in the user. As a, a desk sculpture, the object, object acts as a reminder of the power of this chemical form of happiness, 
and it invites the owner's interpretation of what this might mean to them. This piece also comes with a, a pamphlet of stories that each explore a range of different potential narratives as to how it could play a variety of roles in the lives of four fictional individuals. The object now lives uh, in the home of wonderful Stacy and Igor, who live in Charleston in South Carolina. They are two professionals, design professionals in fact, and keen art collectors who were drawn to this piece when it was on show and on display during London Design Week. Stacy told us how difficult she finds it to reflect upon and capture happiness, and how this object has now become a point of reference for contemplation on their own happiness as individuals and as a family. So you can see from a project like this that we're not taking a conventional problem-solving approach to design. This might be the most contentious slide of the day. <laughs> might be. This is a chart I produced for my tenure review presentation at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, which tries to reveal some of the differences in values, process, and methodology between the atelier model of independent design practice and the design thinking model practiced by most design consultancies. To summarize, the atelier model is experimental, open-ended. It's about learning through doing. It is intuitive, sometimes irrational. But it asks questions of its audience, and it creates design as a cultural experience. The design thinking model is instrumental. It solves problems through observation, insight, and logical decision making. It is goal-oriented and sees itself as serving society and commerce in equal measure. Now, our position is that design is a broad church and that both of these models and, indeed, what lies between them are valid and important ways of practicing. However, it is clear that design thinking model, uh, especially here in the US, seems to take precedence almost to the exclusion of anything else and that, in our view, the imaginative and speculative approaches to, to design are too often dismissed, either as art or as decadent or irrelevant, when in fact, history shows that they can be the seeds to whole new behaviors, policies, or product lines. So we've made the choice to position our activity towards the atelier model, and we'd like to take a few minutes to explain how we got there and some of the people and projects that have shaped our thinking. So we both studied uh, on programs that were heavily involved in making. So uh, Jess came from a, a craft-based 3D design program. I studied in industrial design in the days before 3D printing and CNC machines meant that you didn't have to touch materials at all. But this love of making definitely influences the fact that we're very keen to realize projects through the making of objects rather than just virtual visualizations, whether these are models or products available for sale. And at graduate level, we both uh, experienced two very intense but different academic design cultures uh, that have had a lasting impact on how we practice. And both of these were at the Royal College of Art in London. So I was fortunate enough to arrive at the RCA when designer Ron Arad had just taken over what would become the design products department. And he created an incredibly diverse and plural studio culture there. So aligning myself with teachers, including Konstantin Gurchich and Jasmine Morrison, I studied how objects could borrow existing form to poetic or practical effect. I fell in love with French filmmaker Jacques Tati on the right here, uh, and his critique of novelty in films like Mon Oncle. And I saw the extraordinary, extraordinary rigor of Italians like Achille Castiglioni and Enzo Mari. And I wrote my dissertation about designers who use found objects in their work. And as you may know, Ron, uh, Jasper Morrison, and Tom Dixon all started their careers that way. <coughs> so the breadth of that experience uh, played uh, an important role uh, in my book, Thinking Objects, uh, which came out in 2009. 
Um, so the diversity of the design products uh, platform system seeded the main chapter of this book that was entitled Motivation. Uh, and that highlights uh, the subjects that seem to be the main driving forces behind uh, the work of most product designers today, be that aesthetic refinement, social inclusion, material experimentation, user participation, ethics, sustainability, or design to provoke debate. And since leaving the RCA, I've split my time between designing products for British and European manufacturers, writing, and teaching for 10 years in the UK and four years in Chicago. So when I arrived at the RCA a few years later after you, Tim, uh, there had also been a change of leadership on the design interactions program that I signed up to. Critical designers Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby just took over. Dunn and Raby introduced their methods of critical design into the curriculum with the aim to encourage us to consider the more social, cultural, and ethical consequences of emerging technologies and in doing so, to ask more probing questions through our design process. We explored a range of issues, some relating to bio and nanotechnologies, as well as the expressive possibilities of digital technologies, framing debates between people and possible futures, and between design and other fields of art and science. Whilst I was at the RCA, I did a, a, an internship at a place called Foresight, which is a UK government think tank. And we were asked to consider the future impacts of obesity in the UK specifically over the next 40 years. We generated a number of different scenarios to engage the public in a more dynamic way and to provoke discussion within the think tank with the hope of changing policy in the coming years. It was, then that I, it was then that I became interested in scenario planning and how design can be used as a tool to tell stories about how technology and science will affect our futures. For my final thesis project, I designed my own fictional personal futures think tank called FATE, the Futures Association for Therapy and Entertainment. And it is a new service that combined corporate futures methodologies with the more ancient divination methods whilst exploring the rituals that might be created from the rise of commercial predictive gene testing. Um, Tony Dunn has a great quote that I often refer to when talking about this type of design. He says, speculative design is a means of speculating on how things could be. It aims to open up new perspectives for discussion and debate about alternative ways of being, and, it, and to inspire and encourage people's imaginations to flow freely. So I have a, a fabulous Venn diagram that shows where my interest in speculative design lies, at the intersection of applying design as storytelling with the, with the use of objects and imagery, exploring the impacts of emerging technology and science in the context of the everyday life, and borrowing existing and definitely creating new futures methodologies. So this area has been the main focus of my independent practice since I left the RCA. And prior to moving to Chicago four years ago, I worked in various design consultancies in London, uh, including Seymour Powell's Foresight team, uh, Sense Worldwide, a design research uh, consultancy, and engine service design. It's also a net time of my life that I like to call my post-it note period. Um, so moving on to the next slide. <laughs> Not that you've got anything against post-it notes. No. In fact, we've got thousands of them in we our studio. We have thousands. Right? <laughs> so um, to be reductive about it, our collaborative practice finds the common ground between Jess's future-oriented speculative approach and my rather more present-oriented, pragmatic approach. And fortunately, while these may appear opposite, we found ways for them to intermesh effectively. Uh, it's perhaps worth pointing out at this stage that uh, although we've been together 11 years and married for four, and it's actually our wedding anniversary today. <laughs> oh. oh, stop it. <laughs> I know, it was a cheap, it's a cheap comment, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> 
And, uh, we've only made a concerted effort to work together for the last 12 months. I, said, I don't know what that says about our <laughs> marriage. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, this is the other book uh, with Dream on the cover. Uh, Stephen Duncombe's Dream, Reimagining Progressive Politics in an Age of Fantasy. And in it, uh, Duncombe uses the phrase spectacular vernacular to describe today's cultural landscape suggesting that with almost everything becoming a spectacle, the spectacular has become the new vernacular. Now, we're not interested in spectacle for its own sake. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're keen to explore how its relationship with what we traditionally understood as the vernacular, the overlooked everyday object, can prompt new thoughts and actions. So we're going to take you through a couple of projects that do this uh, in different ways. So I mentioned my interest in using found objects in design. My fa fascination with this hasn't really got that much to do with recycling, however. Um, rather, the power behind this approach is that by taking these vernacular objects out of their expected context and placing them where they will be reconsidered, uh, it gives the opportunity for creating some kind of poetic response. So uh, you might have seen this book when I was talking about my time at the Royal College. Uh, it's Charles Jenks and Nathan Silver's 1972 book, ad hocism, the case for improvisation. And it's been a lasting influence on me, particularly. And in fact, it was recently reissued uh, by MIT Press. Um, I returned uh, to it when I uh, moved to Chicago when we were asked to create an installation at the Museum of Contemporary Art. So borrowing the title and theme, we built an interactive exhibit that paid homage to the book by using its methodology throughout the exhibit design and the objects that were on show. To avoid the waste that exhibitions usually generate, we made all the exhibit furniture out of materials found behind the scenes at the MCA, using them in such a way that they could be returned undamaged, including this peculiar object that was originally used for hanging Andreas Gursky photographs, which made a rather nice bench. We printed a poster which contained an essay I wrote, and we designed these letter forms on the left from household objects to act as signage for the exhibition. For the show, I also designed a series of tables called American Ad Hoc that were made by repurposing three classic American products that seem to occupy a special place in American consciousness, yet also seem regularly to, to be left to rust in people's garages. The radio flyer cart, the Weber grill, and the typical red steel wheelbarrow. And this also reflected a kind of wider interest that we have, have uh, about the American vernacular. So we've kept a photo blog since we've been here uh, called Alien Americana, uh, from the point, uh, fact that uh, when you come here as an outsider, you're branded as a, an alien. <laughs> Uh, and this highlights uh, what we've found, if not spectacular, then at least intriguing about the American uh, landscape and objects in the American landscape. Anyway, uh, each of these American classics was fitted with a marble top, which, uh, while inhibiting their original function, introduced a new one and provided a touch of luxury that offsets the shabbiness of the rusting original and allowed them to be retired into the home in celebration of their lifetime of service. Okay, another way in which the spectacular and the vernacular intersect is the production of the fake reel, of artifacts that are part of a scenario that is fictional but looks completely convincing. These objects are meticulously handcrafted to have the precision of the mass produced in order to achieve the suspension of disbelief necessary for the work to be effective. In 2011, I was asked to create a design response to collector Richard Harris's exhibition, Morbid Curiosity, at the Chicago Cultural Center, which featured a huge array of Memento Mori artworks, mostly featuring images of skulls and skeletons. I created these series of objects and short stories collectively presented under the guise of a fictional organization called MIMO, short for Memento Mori as a means of generating a context for new rituals and objects to exist in. Rather than focusing on the visualization of death and dying, I was interested in exploring the process of mourning and loss 
and investigate how design and new technologies could be used to soften the blow of the feelings surrounding our sense of mortality. This project combines stories of life, love, and loss with objects that explore a range of new poetic rituals and attitudes towards death and mourning. Though you are never told who the characters are and only read a small portion of their life and death, you understand and begin to empathize with their love and experience the intimacy they shared. This one, uh, entitled Objects of Our Fears, is as a representation of the extracted tumor, of an extracted tumor, plated in gold leaf and worn as a piece of jewelry. The owner in the story, the owner of the jewelry, explains the impact it has had on her sense of overcoming such fear and anxiety of such an invasive surgery. So during that project, it was a very intense project, as you can imagine, three members of my own family uh, sadly passed away and inevitably, these experiences fed into the designs of each object and fictional story. You can see all the objects and read the stories, and I really advise you to spend a lot of time reading through the stories on the website, with maybe a whiskey. <laughs> uh, and the website is memo.co. However, I do want to talk more about the research behind the project. Um, although, the results of fiction, although the result is a range of fictional objects, each is based upon actual developments in science and technology and, and philosophy, and was also informed by some amazing experiences I had upon meeting various groups of experts and making a few different types of visits with these experts who dealt with death and mourning as part of their professional lives. One such amazing experience was a visit to the Chicago National Funeral Directors Convention which really opened my eyes to the breadth and depth of the commercialization of the death industry. It's full of amazing design crime. Uh, I advise you, if you get a chance, it comes to New York, you should definitely visit. Uh, and in particular, the range of dark humor on offer is quite fantastic. So, <laughs> I, was, I was waiting a little bit. <laughs> I also met with a number of practitioners who work in the death and dying industry, including these two music thanatologists who work in hospice and palliative care. Their role, I do not, their role is to play the harp at your bedside as you die. I kid you not, this, these people are amazing. Um, another interesting expert along, along the way I met was a mortician who's based in LA who runs her own art collective called The Order of the Good Death. And her particular interest is to make the discussion of death and dying more accessible. And in doing so, she has her own amazing YouTube series called Ask a Mortician. I advise you to visit that too. <laughs> uh, despite these objects being speculative, I wanted to highlight the fact that they are very, there are very few objects out there designed for mourning and yet it is something that most of us will experience in our lives. Exhibiting and talking about this project, which I always really enjoy doing, to different audiences has often caused very emotional reactions, as you can imagine. Some people have broken down and cried, whilst others have been fascinated, and some just shut down and walk away. But on the whole, I found it's operated as a way to start a conversation on a topic that we can all relate to, but don't always know how to. Um, for time, I'm going to zoom by into our next project that we're working on right now called New Survivalism. Um, has anyone here heard of bug out bags? <laughs> Some of you. Okay. Those with your hand up know that a bug out bag is a kit of provisions for short term survival after a disaster or other calamitous scenario. As a limited and contained set of objects, the bug out bag is an interesting uh, object because the choice of what goes in yours says a lot about your values, principles, superstitions, hopes and fears at the most critical moment. However, most bug out bags are identical. Canned food, medical supplies, perhaps a weapon. The focus is, is on reverting to tried and tested means, rejecting new technology and going back to basics. As such, it is anything but progressive. For the upcoming Istanbul Design Biennial, we will be creating 
a series of alternative bug out bags that will, hope, that will avoid the bunker mentality and respond to currently emerging research in technological change, environmental conditions, and belief systems. These are not the final kits in this image. They are some teaser images we created for a press launch. And the project will be using designed objects and storytelling to explore the survival strategies of a disparate group of individuals, each with a very different take on what they need. Uh, yeah, we're pretty much out of time, but uh, I just wanted to uh, briefly uh, conclude. Uh, this was some images in relation to uh, a workshop at the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, that kind of touched on similar issues to the Istanbul project. Um, but to conclude, I think our, our main kind of message, if you like, is that we feel that science fiction uh, doesn't really have to be the only place when we come into contact with the never-before-seen pro product or service, and that uh, by having a, an object as a uh, particular point of contact and a point of discussion, uh, that opens up a whole range of possibilities that were, were not uh, uh, there previously. So, you know, we're interested in, uh, in finding the points uh, at which uh, we, those connections can be made, uh, whether those be through exhibitions, objects getting out there into the world in stores, through workshops, or through publications. So we hope our presentation has planted a few seeds as to how building the spectacular vernacular might uh, open up new possibilities for your own design practices. And please do come and seek us out afterwards if you have questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.